Martin doesn't really need an introduction, uh, but it's not sufficient. So I'll go ahead. So Martin Duraki is a distinguished university professor of AI and IR at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's also the scientific director of the National Innovation Center for AI in the Netherlands. And uh, he has been working on logic in the beginning, has moved to information to go, I think, early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken, and has been incredibly active in information retrieval, recommender systems, and AI in general. Uh, his research is focused on designing trustworthy technology to connect people to information, particularly search engines, recommender systems, and conversational assistance. So uh, this group is working on a lot of stuff relevant to what we do here at UMass. So, uh, really, really looking forward to this talk. Uh, his recent focus targets to um, targets two key questions. And the first one is how can we create intrinsic trust in IR systems that is aligned the reasoning process with human expectations? And the second one is how can we establish extrinsic trust in IR systems? <laughs> That is establish uh, verifiable guarantees on their behavior. So I'm really uh, excited to hear what uh, Martin has to offer to us. And um, please, Martin, go ahead and proceed. All right. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation uh, to begin with. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, we have. Um, uh, many shared interests. We also have many shared friends uh, and, and colleagues, and uh, I hope um, there's lots of conversations going on uh, back and forth between uh, uh, colleagues uh, at UMass and colleagues at the uh, University of Amsterdam, so I hope uh, we can see some of that result in uh, joint research. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, something we sort of stumbled upon a few years ago, but then started seeing more and more. And that's the, the phenomenon of um, uh, repeat behavior and uh, repeat consumption and uh, people's interest in, in seeing the same or consuming the same, interacting with the same uh, documents or items uh, over and over again. And um, so I'll take you through uh, uh, a few of the papers that have resulted from this. It's still an ongoing line of work with a, with a bunch of colleagues and a bunch of uh, PZ students. So let me acknowledge them first. So Morshne, Min, uh, Sami, Ming, uh, Sebastian, and uh, and Andrew. Uh, so as I said, it's recent and ongoing joint work uh, with them. So first of all, um, just to set the scene, uh, uh, human repeat behavior uh, can be observed everywhere. Um, I have a few examples uh, that you're probably familiar with. Um, so if you look at some of the the theories on on uh, social choice, you'll you'll see that um, boredom is the single most and simple explanation for uh, uh, changes in individual and social choices. Um, and so, deviating from uh, the, the repeat behavior uh, studies into um, restaurant visits, um, I've, I've uh, uncovered that uh, satisfaction revisit. Uh, intention uh, leads to stronger relationship in um, in uh, people that uh, um, are likely to switch or are unlikely to switch than in uh, uh, in high switching barrier groups. Um, repeat purchases, so that um, uh, that there has been shown that trust has a lower effect than than habit on uh, repeat purchase intention. So uh, you'll stick with it. Stick with your 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 habits, uh, even if uh, you might not fully trust um, uh, the supplier or the products that you're interacting with and that you're repeating uh, to interact with. And of course, as, as some of you will know uh, studies that uh, our colleagues at big big search engines have done uh, into repeat search behavior uh, over the years. Um, uh, so. Uh, Folks at, at Microsoft uh, and Bing have done this. Folks at uh, Yahoo have done this. Uh, also, not just looking at web search behavior, but also at, um, for instance, at, at um, more personal information management, uh, email search. 
there it was found that over half of uh, the the selections on messages uh, is uh, some sort of refinding behavior. So uh, going back to an email that you've looked for before. Um, Similarly, on, on web pages, people revisit web pages uh, that they've already visited before. Uh, around 40% of page views are revisitations. And uh, around 40% of web queries, at least in some of those older uh, Yahoo search logs, are repeat queries. Um, in, in, uh, in the setting of recommender systems, uh, in different domains, uh, with different types of uh, items that, that can be recommended, you see different types of uh, repeat behavior, but it's it's all over the place. So in video recommendation, uh, repeat consumption plays a, a big role in uh, achieving state-of-the-art recommendation performance. So just show the same video again, offer it again. Um, in e-commerce, uh, repeat purchase uh, recommendation on Amazon uh, led to uh, a 7% increase in, in CTR in personalized recommendation pages. And um, as we'll see in a few minutes, um, in lots of different uh, session-based, uh, basket-based, uh, or within basket-based recommendation scenarios, uh, re repetition plays a, a really big role. And so let's first disentangle a, a few uh, recommendation tasks, and then I'll, I'll briefly talk about some of the repeat uh, phenomena that we've seen there and that we've tried to exploit in, in recommendation methods. So um, these are some of the tasks uh, we've been looking at. So session-based recommendation, we have uh, a session, we have no information about the user, and um, uh, we're trying to recommend the next item that might go with what uh, the user has already selected um, uh, in the ongoing session. Next basket recommendation is where we would have uh, historical information about a user. So baskets or sets of items that they've um, purchased or consumed before. And then we try to recommend the next basket. And within basket uh, recommendation where is where um, we have information both about uh, the history, so the, the user's historical behavior and, and purchase. Um, behavior, but also we know uh, we have information about the current basket that they're filling. And so session-based, next basket, and within basket. Those are scenarios that, that you'll see uh, show up um, over the next couple of minutes. So let's look at uh, session-based recommendation. So um, uh, when trying to think, uh, we're trying to, when working on uh, uh, sequence to sequence type of uh, models for um, session-based recommendation, we stumble upon the fact that in many of the data sets that we used, uh, so uh, you choose uh, Digenetica, Last.fm, a lot of the items uh, are repeat items. Um, and so that led us to um, think about, uh, okay, what can we do? Can we can we um, automatically learn to switch between repeat items and and explore items? So items that a user has not interacted with. Uh, and this is a session based uh, scenario, so we don't have historical information. All we have is what we see uh, in the current session, and so. Repetition means repetition within the session. And exploration means new with respect to um, what we've seen already in the session. And then the model was actually ridiculously simple. Uh, we have two encoders, decoders, um, or rather we have one encoder and two decoders. One decoder uh, um, has a, a re focus on repeat, the other focus on explore, and then we learn when to switch to the repeat mode or to the explore mode, and that's it. And that it's a very simple uh, architecture, and, and it does really well, and it does a lot better than uh, far more uh, complicated uh, 
models that try to learn really complex representations of, of, a, of, a, of a developing session. Um, yeah, the, the numbers are not so important. What's, what's important here is uh, this led us to think uh, more about uh, repeat behavior uh, and then more interesting repeat behavior where we have a longer history. Um, and so that naturally drove us to, to consider uh, next basket recommendation. So I'll spend a bit more time talking about that. And hey, so, Martin. Martin. Sure. This is Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Uh, hi. Yeah, quick question. So you were saying that uh, it was beneficial to repeat items even in the same session. Yep. So you keep saying to somebody, oh, what about this? What about the, the, same, the same thing over again? Well, of course, it depends. It really depends on the, the sort of uh, uh, market or product category that um, that you're working in or working with. Uh, but there are some, uh, especially in, the, for instance, in music, where this really uh, matters a lot and, and makes a positive difference. Okay, I can, yeah, I can see that for some domains, that would yeah. make sense. Okay, thank you. And so here, uh, in next basket recommendation, uh, uh, what we've been working with, uh, with a, a large um, uh, grocery uh, brand here uh, in Europe. And, but, um, you know, the to, to some degree, you see similar phenomena in uh, a music recommendation with playlists, in uh, sort of recommendations where uh, in, in a holidays in a you know holiday travel setting where it's not just a trip that you're uh, recommended, but a trip with maybe an excursion and another excursion and a, and a visit to a museum and and what have you. So a, a package of items that go together. Um, Another scenario would be a reading list. So maybe you have a new PSE student joining the team, recommend a reading list to that person of, uh, of papers. And of course, in a reading list setting, it doesn't really make sense to recommend the same paper over and over again. It might make sense to read the same paper a few times to thoroughly understand it. But there's, in these different scenarios, there, there are different degrees of, um, of repeat behavior. There's certainly a lot uh in music uh there's uh some in video uh, as we know from uh, netflix experiments there's an awful lot in um in uh in grocery shopping oh. and so this this maybe as an aside this this um scenario of, of grocery and shopping uh, is increasingly of interest to uh, um some of us uh, at the IR lab in Amsterdam, search problems, uh, recommendation problems, uh, also conversational assistance problems, uh, think of help desks, think of um, uh, uh, requests uh, uh, for returns of, uh, of items, but also replenishment, um, uh, forecasting problems, uh, and increasingly um, you know, sort of traditional search and recommendation tasks, but then with additional um uh societal uh values so uh don't just recommend any type of food try to recommend healthy food um or try to food uh if especially um if you're dealing with um fresh food try to uh recommend it maybe try to recommend it at a reduced price before it uh uh is uh well beyond its best buy date and so uh, sort of dynamic pricing uh, scenarios uh, are uh, actually a lot of fun to work with. And uh, in this grocery setting, uh, NBR, Next Basket Recommendation, is a very natural uh, problem uh, to look at, right? Because uh, usually people get their food products um, in a basket. And usually we also have their historical purchases um, organized in baskets. Now, looking at the, at the literature um, uh, on uh, algorithms for next basket recommendation, uh, 
Uh, some of the older methods are nearest neighbor based methods. Uh, they try to uh, model the personal history of, of users, or they even try to model um, individual time series for products per user. Um, uh, more recent methods try to develop um, fairly complex uh, representation learning methods, uh, specifically, uh, of course, for users, for items, but also for baskets. Um, right, and what's interesting here is uh, there's uh, well, uh, often when we do recommendation, when we look at recommendation problems, we have different types of, of sparsity, right? Um, new items comes in, new items, sorry, come in, and we don't know a lot uh, about uh, those items uh, until uh, they've been around for a while. Uh, of course, we have that too in a, in a grocery setting. Uh, lots of new food products come in, um, but we also have a, a they either uh, catch on somehow, and then uh, very quickly uh, there's a good amount of data to work with, or they they don't catch on and then they disappear. Um, so that, that's interesting because that also means that you can with new products, new food products, you can uh, do reasonably low risk um, exploration. That's another topic I'm happy to talk about later, but um, there's some interesting peculiarities of this domain. Uh, the most interesting for this talk is the, the repurchase behavior. People tend to buy the same sort of food over and over and over again. And you might think, if once you've discovered it, once you've looked at data, uh, you might think, uh, well, why then do we need uh, complex uh, basket representation learning methods if uh, a lot of the behavior is actually repeat behavior? Can't we simply do something like, uh, you know, personal most popular items uh, and then occasionally mix in um, something new, something unexplored? Let's see. As I said, uh, in the literature, there's a, a bunch of methods. The older ones that are, um, are centered around the uh, nearest neighbor uh, approaches, more recent ones, uh, neural network based uh, representation learning ones. Ah, question in the chat. Ah, all right. Good. Um, so we first, uh, when we started to explore this space, uh, we first uh, thought, well, why don't we do? Um, a reproducibility study. Let's look at the methods. Let's put them side by side. Let's do a bake-off between all of them under the same conditions, because it turned out that uh, in many cases they were uh, not compared under the same uh, conditions. So we we tried to do that, and then uh, or we did that actually, and we then um, ended up with a fairly um, long paper that was submitted to. Uh, uh, toys uh, quite a while back already, but recently uh, it's been accepted uh, with some minor revisions. So I'm happy to share that paper. Um, the main question that it uh, addresses is, uh, do the performance gains of these deep learning based uh, next possible recommendation methods actually hold up when we do a fair and systematic comparison? There's um, three uh, data sets that we used. Tafong, Danhambi, uh, Instacart, they're all um, uh, you know, shopping transactions. Uh, uh, some uh, have a, a cover a longer period, some a somewhat shorter period. Uh, some have a very large collection of items, um, a large catalog. Uh, and some have a somewhat smaller ones. And so uh, using these three data sets, we looked at uh, three types of methods, frequency-based, so just counting what is most popular or what is most uh, maybe across the population, but also what is most popular for an individual user and different mixtures of this. Nearest neighbor methods and, and deep, deep learning-based uh, methods. And then we looked at uh, the standard measures that, that are often used in this, um, in this space, so recall how many of the good items do we uh, do we surface and ECG, and um, 
and personal hate, right? Um, because there's such uh, a big role for uh, repeat items, we also came up with some new measures, namely uh, the proportion of uh, repeat items, so items that, a, that an individual user uh, has seen and consumed before versus explore items, items that they have not um, consumed before. So the paper has many, many, many tables. I'm not going to um, drown you in those tables on a late Friday afternoon um, or Friday evening in my case. Let me just summarize uh, what we learned there. Um, turned out that no single NBR method consistently outperforms all other methods across all of the data sets. The methods that uh, have been uh, published, they're all either heavily skewed towards uh, uh, exploiting repeat behavior or exploiting uh, exploration behavior. Um, there's also an enormous uh, performance gap uh, between uh, repetition and exploration. Uh, recommending repeat items is much, much easier for a number of reasons. One is for an individual user, if you know their repeat items, uh, that set of items is usually many orders of magnitude smaller than the, than the entire catalog. So a smaller set of items to select from. And if you have sufficiently uh, long historical chains, so to say, then you can, then the methods that are repeat heavy, they can uncover um, the time series and will successfully use them. The deep learning based NBR methods are often outperformed even by frequency-based uh, baselines that simply fill the basket with uh, the most frequent items that a, a user has purchased and possibly uh, add some, some additional items if there's still space left in the basket. And uh, for that uh, topping up, you can simply use um, the most popular items, uh, most popular across all users. And looking at uh, the gains that uh, uh, more recently published methods have made and have reported, it turns out that most of those gains actually come from uh, gains in um, in repeat behavior, in being better able to uh, recommend repeat items. Even though many of those methods have fairly complex um, modules, strategies, uh, learning strategies, that target exploration. Um, so uh, that was uh, uh, a brief summary of, uh, of this reproducibility study. Uh, based on that, we, we um, then try to be uh, creative, not just comparing existing methods, but also coming up with our own uh, method based on the insights from the reproducibility study. Um, I want to share with you uh, two um, two ideas we've we've published recently. One is uh, published at uh, ZIGIR 2022, and the other will be published shortly at, uh, at Wisdom. So um, what we did in the ZDIR paper devoted to uh, uh, repeat aware next basket recommendation is, well, let's first look at uh, at the data and, uh, and repeat behavior in the data that we have access to. And um, so we looked um, for the purpose of this talk, uh, I'll summarize uh, a look uh, at two data sets. One is uh, Instacart, which is a a public data set, uh, the other, um, well, online that is, and then offline we have three, uh, Dunhambi, Valued Shopper, and um, X offline. We also have X multi-channel and X online. The X is a um, grocery brand here in Europe uh, uh, with whom we work, uh, and they gave us access to both uh, online purchase behavior, offline purchase behavior, so that's, um, normal 
brick and mortar uh, shopping behavior a multi-channel that users who um, use a loyalty card um, both when they shop uh, online and or offline so we have different um, uh, different sorts of shopping behavior uh, for the same user um, so what do we see here uh, lots of numbers um, what's interesting to see is that uh, the basket size is uh, you know between close to 10 and uh, in the uh, in usually in the offline setting and it can be as much as uh, uh, over 40 in um, in the online setting on average of course the there are um, outliers, uh, single item purchases versus uh, uh, purchases with hundreds and hundreds of items. But, you know, uh, and a lot of this you can easily explain because it's more convenient to buy uh, more stuff online. You don't have to carry it around, uh, take it, uh, well, in the Netherlands, on your bike home or, or um, uh, in the car. Um, so what we see here is a, a, a repeat ratio across baskets. Um, so the repeat items are items that are previously bought by the customer. Repeat ratio is the proportion of repeat items in a basket. And um, we've we've binned, binned uh, the baskets here, and you see uh, that uh, the repeat ratio can actually go up to... Uh, 70 80 percent in some of the data sets and uh, but it's uh, uh, as you see it's um it's a, a very common phenomenon in this data now you can uh, of course if you have the data you can play um, you can play god uh, run some oracle experiments where you know what to choose whether it, it should be a, a repeat item or an explore item and again uh, it's, it makes sense to to look at this because um, you can uh, get an understanding for how much of the performance actually comes from just looking at repeat items uh, and so again this is important because those are really small sets of items not the entire catalog of tens of thousands of items. So uh, in a typical grocery data set that we had access to, that could be uh, 40, 50, 60,000 items. But in the, personal, um, in the personalized uh, next basket recommendation scenario, uh, most people would only have um, somewhere between 50 and 100 items that they would regularly um, interact with. Um, right, so what we did uh, when thinking about this problem and, and thinking about how to design a, a, a model for this, um, you know, what, what are some of the key uh, indicators that we should take on board? Um, naturally, the personal uh, item consumption pattern, um, the consumption patterns of, uh, of the same item by other users and consumption patterns of, of other but similar um, items. It let it gave rise to this really simple um, architecture uh, where we do uh, representation learning of uh, the relation between uh, users and items. We then feed this to uh, uh, a learning stage where we uh, learn the, the consumption pattern. So if you like, uh, the intuition behind this is um, in a sense, try to pick up the time series uh, of the interactions between a user uh, and an item. And then finally, this, uh, this should produce uh, a probability of an item being uh, included in the next basket uh, for a given user. Lots of numbers. Um, of course, we we do well uh, on both on the open data sets uh, and on the, the proprietary data set. That's maybe not so interesting. What's interesting is um, this is now uh, being uh, uh, A/B tested in production, so that um, those results are not in the paper because the paper we we published at JKR last summer. But hopefully, we can report on this uh, in the near future. 
what's interesting is what's also interesting is this that uh, the, the performance of this architecture is not sensitive to the number of items or the number of baskets per users uh, but it does have a positive correlation with the average repeat ratio of users so if you have a, a user uh, who repeats who has a, a high degree of repeat behavior we tend to do better than for users uh, who don't repeat uh, all that much chat uh, yes uh, so the bruce asks uh, doesn't the time between basket purchases influence repeat behavior it certainly does yeah and um, the idea is that uh, with this um, consumption pattern learning module in the middle here we should be able to pick up uh, um, some of that temporal order whether it's the right time again to um, to um, to recommend something there was a paper also at kdd this summer or maybe last summer uh, but i think it was this summer yeah um, that try to really explicitly model all of the time series uh, of um, per individual user of every item that they interact with and then simply try to understand are we at the right stage in the time series to to push uh, an item um, that uh, our somewhat simpler method out, still outperforms that um, there's also uh, a recent paper that simply only focuses on uh, repeat purchases it's called um, I think I have it in the references it's called buy it again um, and so they completely ignore the explore items and only uh, focus on these um, temporal patterns and it I think that's a very natural thing to do um, okay so what are some of the, the lessons that we learned here well first of all uh, it's you know look at the behavior that you see in the data try to understand what the characteristics are and, and make good use of it um, one thing we want to do uh, better in the future and it's part of ongoing work but uh, uh, by no means done is um, become better at, at exploration uh, recommending new items okay uh, let's see um right uh, within basket recommendation so that's a, a slightly different scenario uh, it looks like the the next basket recommendation scenario in that we have um the, the personal history purchase history uh, of a user but we also have an incomplete basket uh, that um that we're trying to fill And so this is a paper um, Moshne will be presenting at Wisdom uh, in uh, in about two months. Um, it builds on the insights uh, from the previous papers that um, that we've uh, published in this space, uh, and uh, the this method should be A/B tested um, early next year. Uh, right now, in December, um, is a busy shopping period, so no experiments. But in the uh, uh, in January, uh, uh, we have a, a few slots reserved um, where we'll do A-B testing of this method. Um, but you will see is uh, some results um, uh, based on open data, based on uh, logged historical, proprietary logged historical data, um, not the A-B test outcomes yet. Anyway, given that these uh, neighborhood-based methods are, are seem to be really effective in this uh, for these recommendation scenarios in this uh, uh, shopping setting um, can't we develop uh, a neighborhood-based method um, that's uh, effective it's also efficient um, so that was the, the 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 goal we set ourselves and so the intuition was uh, let's uh, if we look at the score of an item for a given user a few things uh, play a role um, 
So uh, a personal uh, scoring function, depending on uh, personal characteristics of the user and uh, neighbor-based scoring. And so let me expand on, uh, on those uh, things. So the personal score, uh, we assume, depends on how the user has consumed the item in the past, as well as the items in the current basket. So that has a historical component, this HSF, and the frequency and the recency. So here, this this goes back to your question also, uh, Bruce, um, right? That uh, the time between the current purchase and previous purchases matters. And then uh, the other component here is this BSF, uh, the, the basket-based scoring function. Um, recent items in the current basket are more important than older items. Uh, the distance between a candidate item that we were thinking about adding to a basket and the current items uh, um, in the uh, past baskets is important. And uh, recent baskets are uh, more informative than older baskets. And so, you know, this looks really simple, right? The score is this um, weighted combination of a personal scoring function. The personal scoring function decomposes in this weighted combination of history-based and current. And then uh, we have the neighborhood uh, similarity. Uh, that's uh, uh, yeah. what you would expect it to be, uh, similarity. Uh, we look at the similarity between uh, users. Uh, we look at a set of neighbors uh, of a given user of, of, of a given size. And for those neighboring users, uh, we look at their uh, um, personal score. Sorry, that was the wrong direction. Sorry, what's the question? Okay. And so, the, the again, the goal here is uh, given a history of baskets, the current incomplete basket, um, please recommend the next item for the current basket. And what are the metrics? Uh, MRR, hit rate uh, at different basket sizes, 10 items or 20 items. And as I said, uh, we looked at two data sets, a, a public one and a proprietary one. Proprietary one. Um, uh, Yeah, of course, we beat the baselines, um, as you would expect. Um, we even beat uh, our uh, next basket recommendation method uh, from uh, from uh, from ZIR. Um, we decompose uh, the, the different contributions, uh, see how much they contribute. Um, uh, we look at... Um, different uh, values of these uh, weighted combinations. We look at different uh, contributions of uh, repeat items versus uh, new items. Um, interestingly, uh, we also, uh, in the paper, spent quite a bit of uh, time on, the, um, on efficiency and tried to make uh, this method as, um, uh, as efficient as we can. Um, and as I said, it, it'll go uh, into an A-B a test uh, in a couple of weeks. So um, looking back, um, this was a slightly different uh, problem within basket recommendation, but still uh, here too, you can also exploit uh, repeat behavior. Um, What's next? Uh, looking at, at different domains, uh, uh, looking at different uh, settings of uh, maybe less repeat behavior or even more repeat behavior. And perhaps uh, also based on the A-B test outcomes, uh, looking at uh, what further components we might be able to add while remaining uh, very low uh, in terms of latency. Now there's one more example I'd like to share and then I'll, I, I wanna stop. Um, and that's reverse next period recommendation. Um, so it's, we turn things around. This is not uh, 
uh, user centered but item centered so I have an item and I want to know who are the uh, the users I should recommend this item to and so uh, given an item identify potential users who are likely to to be interested in it um, in the next period um, and again here the exploration uh, and repetition uh, are really different problems it makes a lot of sense uh, to um, pull them apart and to uh, find out how to uh, deal with uh, the explore items with the repeat items so an explore item in this case is an, an item that is new for a user should be recommended to a new user should be recommended to uh, users who've uh, repeat who have consumed it in the past and then learn uh, a mixture of this and the sort of scenario that you can think of is uh, maybe um, uh, you have a limited budget to uh, to um, to hand out items uh, at a reduced rate maybe a special offer but you you cannot uh, you can't afford to hand out this item at a reduced rate to all your users so who are the, the best users to um, uh, to um, uh, recommend this to either because they might become repeat users in the in the past or because they're already repeat users of the item um, and then um, uh, you'd like to in a sense reward them for their loyalty to the item again the, the, the you know when you think about this uh, the, the, there's two things one is um, trying to capture the the habits the other is trying to capture um, the interests uh, of users. And then the, the third component here is to somehow combine these two. And so that, that's what we do here. Um, and that's a paper that is uh, has been submitted to transactions on uh, recommender systems. And uh, we still need to do uh, a few revisions, but that should be out um, in a couple of weeks as well. So let me try and wrap up. Um, so people uh, in many domains are, are uh, creatures of habit. They, uh, they repeat um, the consumption, they repeat their interest. And so uh, I think it's sensible to, to use these repeat phenomena um, in, when you do search uh, and recommendation. Some of the, the questions that we're looking into now um, are, uh, okay, if repeat behavior matters, uh, then of course we need some historical data. How much historical data do we need? Um, uh, certainly here in Europe, uh, there's a, a growing pressure to uh, delete historical data as, as fast as you can. Um, and some of the, the in the grocery setting, uh, um, in some cases, uh, organizations will throw away data after two months. And so for uh, in the grocery setting, that's oh, probably okay to still being able to pick up enough um, enough uh, yeah, enough of the time series, so to say. In other domains, this may not be enough. We don't know. We need to understand this better. Um, and given sufficiently rich uh, historical data of course what you could easily do is uh, experiment with different uh, regimes for deleting data or um, uh, uh, you know, distorting data uh, another uh, interesting question here is um, has to do with fairness of exposure so that's exposure of new items so what if we're in a scenario that uh, where a uh, users mostly repeat where also most of the benefit for the uh, uh, for the recommendation service comes from repeat behavior and only a little bit comes from uh, explore behavior and so how do you deal with a fairness of exposure in such a setting how do you make sure that things that are potentially useful to users are actually uh, uh, have a chance of being seen by users uh, it, even when these users are re, you know die hard repeat users um, 
it looks like some of the, the metrics that have been developed for um, fairness of exposure uh, don't quite capture what we would want to achieve here because you can do really cheap uh, boosts to um, exposure for um, explore items, right? Because explore items, uh, the performance for on explore items is usually much, much, much lower than uh, the performance on the repeat items. So you can take risks uh, with explore items and they won't, on average, they won't cost you a lot. Uh, risks uh, with repeat items cost you a lot more potentially. But then maybe the creating uh, exposure for the for these um, items that don't get enough exposure uh, as explore items is maybe not so meaningful. So we we probably need some some new metrics there. Work in progress. Uh, let's see some papers. Um, Right, uh, I mentioned uh, the papers by Morshda, this paper, buy it again. Um, I mentioned that before. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, let me stop here. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Martin, for the very nice talk. Uh, really enjoyed that. So, uh, we have about 10 minutes for question and answering. Uh, is there any questions from the audience here? Maybe, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, uh, in the last slide, you talked about only keeping um, data for two months because of European regulations. Um, but have you thought about strategies how to, because I can imagine with groceries, especially it's very seasonal, people buy different things in winter than in summer. So yeah. how do you, uh, yeah, have you thought about strategies to deal with that? Um, so one strategy we're exploring is to uh, to get around this uh, delete data after two or three months uh, requirement by distorting the data uh, so that we can uh, keep the data for longer. Uh, or maybe group uh, across um, large groups of users so that it's much, much harder to uh, uh, drill down and uh, identify a particular user from um, from the historical purchases. Uh, so that's that's work in progress. Uh, but but you're absolutely right. there is um, there there are seasonal effects that you would lose uh, if you uh, uh, seasonal uh, patterns that you would lose when you uh, delete data after two or three months. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, James. Hi, Martin. This is James. Um, I'm. I have a question about the um, one of the last things you talked about: the reverse double secret coupon gifting item. Right. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, I'm wondering when all is said and done. Uh, you, so here you're saying, here's an item and here's who might be interested in it. That's the yep. task. You also had the task of here's people and what they might be interested in. So it's the they're, they're reverse of each other. Do you get anything different? Uh, if you went through and every single person in your system tried to figure out what they were interested in, buying, would you get the same values for that one item, just less efficiently? Uh, that's the big question. Uh, or that's the big problem here. Uh, you want to do this efficiently without going through your entire uh, customer base. Okay, so the, the focus of that work was more on how you implement that in a way that, that is efficient given a single item. Uh, yeah, and, the, and but it still uh, gets, uh, gets good uh, uh, effectiveness. I was thinking what you would want to do is give that coupon to the people that were slightly less likely to buy it. Yeah. So there's, uh, 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 yeah, there are some good intuition there. And there's actually a lot of literature, uh, of, uh, not in our world, but in the um, sort of uh, com consumer psychology world. Uh, they often uh, segment. Uh, customers in four groups. Uh, so one group is um, 
And two of these groups, well, one group, whatever you try, they'll never uh, like this. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't go there. Uh, that would be a waste. There's another group, uh, no matter what you do, they will like it anyway. So you don't need to give them the, the discount either. And then there's a group in the middle. Uh, uh, one is a group that uh, might like it uh, once. The other group is the group that might like it once and hopefully they'll continue to like it in the future. And so, of course, that's the group that uh, the supplier would be interested in identifying. Uh, we didn't formalize uh, or formulate the problem like that. Uh, we just took a, a more down to earth um, recommendation uh, perspective. But yeah, there's, there's more that one can do here. Uh, and then, uh, you know, trying to understand what um, what these two groups in the middle that you're really interested in, what they look like, what, what distinguishes them from uh, the the groups on either end that you that can't be convinced anyway, and that are already convinced. Yeah. Okay, thank you, um, Bruce. Uh, yeah, Martin. Um, I was wondering if you had um, any more uh, idea, uh, detail about what approaches you might take to improve the exploration component. In other words, well, just as an example, do you think we, to really do well with exploration, we'll need to have more explicit models than your data currently provides? Uh, for example, modeling food affinities from recipe knowledge, modeling what types of foods people like from their recipe exactly. behavior. Exactly, uh, exactly. And, and more explicit models of item costs, for example, because you, if you recommend a $50 cheese to me, maybe I'll buy it, but a lot of other people wouldn't. <laughs> exactly. And so uh, right now, what we're doing is um, we're talking to, um, uh, you know, uh, consumer uh, specialist at this retail company that... Um, that understand a bit more uh, or quite a bit more about consumer behavior and consumer psychology than, than we do. And, and uh, certainly one thing that has come up is uh, richer knowledge about uh, food, food products, uh, recipes, uh, also related, going back to uh, the question, the first question, making good use of seasonal effects. This is a time of the year that everyone uh, is interested in, I don't know, Christmas related food. Okay, so why don't you explore a bit there because you know that you know that's the, this dominant interest for a few weeks um yeah so indeed a lot more context and a lot more uh a lot more uh in-depth knowledge of of uh, human behavior is needed here okay thanks thank you i also have one question which is a little bit more generic uh so in ir uh, for splitting the data into training and testing we have had multiple ways. One was by time, which inherently includes this repetition of queries in training and testing. And another yeah. was by queries, which kind of uh, removes these repetitions. And uh, I think one of the, uh, there have been debates about what, which, which is the right yeah. way to evaluate and so on. But the more standard way that the community has adopted so far is just by queries because we want to evaluate generalization. Yeah. Authorization. So uh, do you see any relations here or um, is there any concerns of just doing a lot of memorization in, in when we are doing modeling repetition in these tasks? It depends on, uh, you know, uh, what the question is that you want to answer. Uh, if the question is, um, uh, what would I do with a new user? Uh, that I haven't seen before. And uh, am I able to uh, give that person a good deal? Uh, and I mean, or, or decent recommendations or not? Of course, then you would split your data differently from uh, how do I deal, how do I uh, treat my uh, my um, my known customers well? Because there you do want actually, uh, you do want to understand that repeat behavior. Uh, there, the generalization question rather is, uh, is something that goes back to a question that, that Bruce asked. I have a new item here. Uh, will this trigger a good exploration for them? Uh, and the interesting thing is that uh, 
yes, people are creatures of habit, but actually if they discover something new that they like, that's a, a, a much, much, much bigger boost uh, for them than uh, you know buying that same bread again or buying that same cheese again uh, that they know and like. But so good discoveries are of also a big psychological value to them. And so that's a different generalization question than the uh, how do I uh, deal with new users uh, question. So to me, it depends on uh, how we want to generalize. And then you, you organize and split your data accordingly. Yeah. And also, it's related to how to evaluate all search. Sure. Wait more on the new discoveries or repetitions and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the people online or in the audience here? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Please go uh, ahead. So, like, uh, when we buy things online, let's say buy things Amazon, I think a very common pattern is that uh, first you like uh, browse lots of like new items and then like uh, like uh, after you have some like candidates, then you will repeat it like, uh, like uh, click those like uh, items you have already browsed and then like uh, you are kind of like deciding uh, which uh, items to buy. And uh, in this phase of the shopping, so like uh, the like a uh, website should recommend the uh, repeated uh, things. Uh, and uh, do you know like any kind of work that kind of study this behavior, like uh, is able to distinguish between this kind of like a uh, exploring phase of the shopping and the kind of like a decision phase of the shopping? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I certainly recognize the phenomenon. Do I have any paper that spring to mind? Uh, uh, not off the top of my head, um, but uh, certainly uh, from a, from an interface point of view, this has been looked at. Right? Uh, how do I? How do you facilitate this comparative uh, shopping? Uh, there's also, from a consumer psychology point of view, uh, quite a bit of work on uh, just even with, when it's. Uh, a market where there's not a lot of uh, repeat behavior, for instance, uh, big TVs. How often do you buy a big TV? Probably not every other week, right? Uh, still, it makes sense to uh, show to people stuff that they've bought before because it, it triggers a sense of uh, uh, um, recognition. I've been here before. As it, it helps to build trust. Uh, doesn't mean that they'll buy that item probably not the next TV will, will be different, right? Or the next electronic. Uh, and so that has been studied. Uh, I can send some papers. I don't have them in my head right now, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. We are right in time. So let's thank Martin once again.